Today we are going to be looking at a passage of scripture in the book of Hosea. Everybody say, Hosea. Hosea. Now let me give some context uh, for the book of Hosea. Hosea is named after a man, and his name is Hosea. And Hosea, uh, he was called by God to really speak on God's behalf. And in all of the book of Hosea, it records about 25 years of history. Now, if you're a Bible scholar, most of you will probably recognize uh, chapters 1 through 3 of Hosea as being the story of Hosea and his wife, Gomer. Now, I already know there's a Bible scholar in the room like, oh, he's going to share that story today. I will briefly, but that's not the main text for today. If you're new to the Bible, there's this amazing story found in Hosea chapter 1 through 3 where Hosea is called by God to, to marry a woman by the name of Gomer. Shortly after that, Gomer begins to have multiple affairs on Hosea. Rather than God saying, okay, Hosea, you can go and marry another woman, God commands Hosea to go and to find his wife, Gomer, and to actually pay off the debts that she has created and, and, and to actually essentially buy back his wife and to continue to be in covenant with Gomer. Now, this is a picture of what God is doing for the people of Israel at this time. God is saying, hey, people of Israel, we have been in covenants together that you continuously break. And at any moment, if I wanted to, because you've broke the covenant, I could leave you. I could abandon you. But I'm not. I'm actually going to pay the price for what you've done. And that it's also a foreshadowing story in the Old Testament of what is to come in the New Testament for what Jesus did for you and I. You and I, how many of you know, we are sinners in need of a Savior. The, Jesus is the bride to the, the groom, which is the church. And the Bible says that while you and I were still sinners, Christ died for us. What was he doing? He was paying the price to buy back his children. And so this is a beautiful picture of, of the gospel. Well, the remainder, remainder from chapter 4 onward is, is Hosea really talking about that. He's putting some poetry and some language around this idea as how many of us, we will commit to living for God, and then over time we kind of just turn our back on God. We begin to do our own thing, and that's the story of the people of Israel. And what we're going to look at is Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And this is, a, this is a warning that Hosea gives to you and I of what takes place when you and I begin to become lukewarm with God or to reject God. It says, hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. The Lord has brought charges against you. That ain't good. Saying there is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. You make vows and break them. You kill and steal and commit adultery. There is violence everywhere, one murder after another. This kind of sounds like it was written in 2024. That is why your land is in mourning and everyone is wasting away. Even the wild animals and the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea are disappearing. Check this out. Don't point your finger at someone else and try to pass the blame. Doesn't that sound like the culture we live in today? Well, it's that political party's fault. No, it's that political person. No, it's, it's them. And then it, what about us? What are we doing? It goes on and says, my complaint, you priest, is with you. So you will stumble in broad daylight and your false prophets will fall with you in the night and I will destroy Israel, your mother. Now, for those of you who grew up in the 90s, that's not like a mama joke at the end there when it says your mother, you know. Um, Hosea, I'm going to break it down. Some of y'all are like, oh, you know what I mean? It's not like that. Some of y'all, you know what I'm talking about growing up at the lunch table, just mama jokes all the time. And that's exactly what you thought. No. When he says your mother, uh, Hosea, he uses this language when he says your mother. He's actually referring to uh, Israel as a nation. Throughout Hosea, you'll see Hosea refer to people as children. And in those instances, he's actually talking about individuals. 
So when you see it say mother in Hosea, he's talking about collective group, all of the people of Israel. When he says children, he's talking about individuals. Uh, My people are being destroyed because they don't know me. Since your priests refuse to know me, I refuse to recognize you as my priest. Since you have forgotten the laws of your God, I will forget to bless your children. Um, speaking of this series, Old School, I, uh, I enjoy listening to a lot of, like, old school preachers, right? So if you ask me, if you're asking me who are my favorite preachers to listen to, uh, most of them are going to be later in their lives, uh, many of which have already passed, and, and they're now with the Lord. One of my favorite preachers of all time, uh, most of you probably never heard of this guy, his name is Billy Graham, and, um, Billy Graham used to always share this story that that has always stuck with me. I want to share it with you today. And and Billy Graham would share this story about this man many uh, years, decades ago, a couple centuries ago, actually, that this man lived. And he was a famous juggler. And this man would travel around the world, and he would put on all of these huge events where he would juggle. He'd he'd juggle with fire. He'd, He'd throw swords up in the air and all this crazy stuff. And he'd put on all these cool shows. Well, Over the years, he accumulated a large amount of wealth, and he decided, I'm going to retire. I'm going to go back to my homeland, and I'm going to retire from this whole juggling show and all of that. So this was before you could just, like, put all your money in the bank and wire transfer it. So he has to come up with a plan to take all of his money to purchase an asset that he can then take with him uh, to his homeland. So he goes to this jeweler. He takes all of the money he's ever accumulated, buys the largest diamond that he could find. He gets this diamond to take back with him as his retirement fund. Now, before any of y'all get any crazy ideas trying to plot, like, hey, let's take him out after service, get that diamond. This ain't real. (laughs) All right. This is 25 cents. You can have it. Don't rob me after service. So this juggler, he buys this diamond, and he gets on this boat to go back to his homeland. And as he's on this boat ride back home, there's this young boy that recognizes him. (gasps) I know him. He's, He's the juggler. And he said, hey, could you just do a little juggling for me? And he said, of course. So he begins to start juggling and showing this kid some cool stuff. And all of a sudden, everyone from the boat crowds around. And they see him juggling. And, and there's, oh, oohs and ahs. And he finds bottles and things that he can juggle. And finally, he's like, I got to take this up a notch. I got a whole show going on now. So he goes back to his room that's on the boat. He grabs the diamond, his entire life savings. He takes it on the deck and he grabs a few more items and he begins to juggle this diamond. And everyone's like, don't do it, because they know how much it's worth. And he starts to get a little bit more bold, a little bit more brave. He starts to juggle over the edge of the boat. Everyone's like, no, don't do it. And the crowd's going crazy. (sighs) Finally, the boat moves just a little bit. As he tossed it up high in the air, he lost it in the sunlight. As it comes down, it, sit, it hits the side of his hand. As the boat rocks, it falls to the bottom of the ocean, never to be seen again. Now, if you're like me and you have even a little bit of compassion, you probably feel bad for the guy. He just lost all of his worldly possessions. However, how many of you know that our soul is far more valuable than all of the world's possessions. The Bible says that in Matthew 16, 26, some of y'all are like, hold up, pastor. I thought this was old school. We're in Old Testament. I know that's New Testament scripture, but give me a couple today, all right? Matthew uh, 16, 26 says, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? Talking about all of the possessions. What What if you gain all of them, but you lose your own soul? Matthew 16, 26 says, is anything... Worth more than your soul. Just like the man in the story, some of us in our lives right now, you are juggling with your soul. We trust in ourselves and our own ability and, 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 and the fact that, well, I've gotten away with it before. I've done this my whole life and, and I, can, I know what I'm capable of. And, and I, I know the talents that I have. I can keep and continue doing this, and even oftentimes in your life, there are wise people around you trying to urge you to stop. Hey, stop taking those ungodly risks. Don't gamble with your soul like that. Young person in the room today, 
you may have that mother in your life or that grandmother that you think, oh, man, they're always getting on to me. They're always trying to tell me what to do. It's not that they want to get on to you. It's that they recognize the value of your soul. And you're in a season where you don't recognize the value of your soul. And so you're out here playing all of these stupid games, risking your soul. Well, I can continue to do this. And they've seen it many times before you. In generations that come before you, I've seen those moments where that person is gone. There's not another opportunity for you to juggle. You've lost your own soul. But what happens? We, we continue to just juggle more, one more time. Oh, I'll just I'll do it one more time. Never knowing when that boat, when, when it'll move and rock and you'll have your last opportunity forever. The nation of Israel, they gambled with God's instructions here and they lost. How many of you know, it, it's, it's never wise to have controversy with God. Look at verse uh, 1 again. It says, hear the word of the Lord, o, o people of Israel. The Lord has brought charges against you, saying there is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. I often wonder if as Americans, we are in a season where we are experiencing controversy with God. Why are the people of Israel in this moment, in this season, in controversy with, with controversy with God? Well, it tells us there was no faithfulness. There was no kindness. And check this out. It says there was no knowledge of God. Now, in, in the original language in Hebrew in which this was written, that word knowledge is this word yada. Now, that does not mean that they didn't know about God. It, it's more than intellectual. It's talking about relationship. There's a big difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. And so, so what Hosea was saying is, everyone here, all of you in Israel, of course, you've heard the stories of God. You've seen what God has done for our people. You've seen the covenants and commitments that we've made towards God. You all know about God, but you don't live for God. It reminds me of, of our nation right now. In America, it, yeah, 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 of course, you, you live in America, you know about God. Yeah, you've heard, you've heard it said before, we were one nation under God. There's many people in our spheres of influence that know about God, but they don't know God personally in relationship. So, so it's not just talking about knowing God, it's talking about being in relationship. And it tells us what happens in verse 2, when, when we have no faithfulness, when we have no kindness, when we have no knowledge of God, it tells us what takes that place. Murder, stealing adultery, and violence. They were gambling with God, risking that they could embrace sin, check this out, and get away with it. Yeah, they thought, yeah, we, we're God of our own lives. We can, we, can, we, can, we can dabble a little bit here and there. We, we know what we're doing. We, we know where the line is. We just won't cross that. We're just out here having a good time. And they're gambling with their soul. And even more than that, they were gambling with God and at the same time simultaneously thinking that they will still receive the blessings from God. I see it every single day in America. Countless people that think that because they know about God, that they're still going to be on the receiving end of God's blessings, even though they're gambling with certain things in their life. Well, I know that the Bible says that, that sex is reserved for one man, one woman in the context of marriage, but man, that must be outdated. I'm going to do my own thing. And you're gambling with God. Well, I know what's best for my life. When it comes to finances, I know what's best. I'll do what I want to do when I want to do it. Then you get upset when you're not on the receiving end of God's blessing. God's blessings are when you are walking in faithfulness and obedience with him. You guys tracking with me now? So the question is this. What is it in your life right now that you are risking and gambling in your life? What area of your life are you gambling with God? 
Maybe for you, it's your family. And you're like, well, pastor, you don't understand because you're from Texas. But here in Michigan, we only, Michigan, we only get two months of good weather. So uh, we're going to embrace it. You know, we're going to be out of town for the next eight weeks. We're going to take, take a trip up north. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of months. And what you're doing essentially with your children is you're gambling the souls of your kids. Well, we're going to just go on vacation. And hopefully somewhere down the line, they'll, they'll enter into a relationship with God. We're going to go do what we want to do. And then all of a sudden, your kids are wayward. You didn't actually raise them in the church. And you're going, well, where's the blessings for my children? You gambled with their souls. Well, you know, little Johnny, he's real good at, at basketball. And so we think that he's going to make it to the NBA. So he's got, a, he's got all of these different tournaments he's got to go to. So we can't make it to church. Let me tell you something. Little Johnny has 0.0001% chance of making it to the NBA. However, little Johnny has a 100% chance that he'll stand before God the Father. Oh, I'm just going to gamble that he's going to make it to the league. And so what if he does? He won't have the character to sustain him where his talents took him. So what are you gambling with in your life right now? You know the instructions. You know the commands that God gave you for an area, and yet you think you're smarter than God. You, you think, oh, man, this is outdated. I'll do the other stuff, but this one, <laughs> I could just keep doing this. I could keep getting attention from I really didn't mean to drop that one. <laughs> but that was good for the effect. And so it is. You never know when you're going to drop it. <laughs> Maybe the Holy Spirit knocked that one out of my hand. <laughs> Holy Spirit's like, you're dragging this point out. Let me knock it out of your hand. <laughs> God the Father sent an angel to knock that out of my hand just now. This point has gone on way too long. Let's move back into the Bible. The question becomes, how much are you willing to lose? Because you cannot hide your sin from God. Last week we read Psalm chap, uh, uh, chapter 139, verses 9 through 12. Today I want to read the, the, the verses before that, 1 through 8. This is Psalms 139, uh, verses 1 through 8. Check this out. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. God knows everything about you in this very moment. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. A.K.A. you cannot outrun God even in your thought life. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going. Check this out. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Don't forget about that. We're going to come back to that. He places his hand of blessing on your head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me to, too, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to the heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If you are a believer, God's hand is on your life. The thing is, if you continue to gamble with God, eventually God's hand of favor, blessing will come off of your life. And so today, uh, when, when Hosea gave us this chapter, chapter 4, it was a warning for the people of Israel. And so what I want to do today is I want to I help you, give you a warning of what will happen if you continue to gamble with God. Not potentially, it will happen. Why? Because the Bible says that sin always leads to destruction. Sin always leads to death. And in our silly human nature, we think that we're going to be the one to beat the odds. <laughs> I'll just outsmart God. I'll just, I'll just keep gambling in these areas and I'll do the other things. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll even give a tithe to the church. 
Maybe that'll make God happy, and then that way he'll just ignore all the other sin that I'm doing in my life. God doesn't need your money. The Bible says that God desires your heart. The reason why we tithe is, is it's a test of our heart. You think God needs your tithe? If God wanted to you could drop a trillion dollars in the church bank account right now. Well, I got all of this stuff. Oh, you've accumulated some gold? Okay, that's worthless. In heaven, we walk on that. We walk on streets of gold. I'm trying to get you to understand how big God is. And here we are. Oh, I can, I can manipulate God. You're fooling yourself. You're allowing the enemy to get a foothold. So what happens? What happens when we, when we lose everything, when we've been gambling with God? I'm going to tell you four things that you'll lose. The first one is this, a lost foundation. What did it say in verse 6? It says, my people are being destroyed because they don't know me. Once again, this is not about knowing about God. This is about being in relationship with God. We are living in very scary times in America where we are, we have people that are actively trying to take God out of everything. You see, I'm, I'm a millennial and I remember those seasons where, where the government was trying to take God out of the public school system. See, because I still get to hear stories from my parents where they say, hey, you know what? In every public school classroom, the Ten Commandments used to be posted. And then my dad tells me stories about how every morning the principal from that school or somebody from the school would get onto the intercom and would pray over, in the name of Jesus, would pray over the whole school. Was that, was that at a private school? As a public school. That, that's what was taking place. And, we, and, and people said, no, we got to get God out of, out of all of this. And let me tell you what happens when you take God out of things. What happens is people begin to start serving the master of free will rather than serving the God that gave us free will. And we live in a time where free will has become many people's God. I could do what I want to do when I want to do it. and You can't stop me. Eventually, God's hand will come off. If you keep gambling, if you keep gambling with those areas in your life, God's hand will come off. That is what you're gambling with, your soul. What good is it to gain so much pleasure if you lose your soul? That is the stakes that we're talking about. And because we've removed the Ten Commandments from public school classrooms, now, just one generation later, people don't look at them as the, the Ten Commandments. They look at them as the Ten Suggestions. What will the next generation think? Oh, look at those silly things. <laughs> That's what happens. We're always only one generation away from, from a godless society. That's why we have to stand strong. We have to have a firm foundation. We have to be a remnant in this city where when people look around and go, man, it doesn't look like God is still here. They could go, no, look down the street. Look over there on Michigan Avenue. There's hundreds of people that still declare that he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords and that we serve him with all of our strength and all of our might. People who are unafraid to share the good news of the gospel. We have a dying world. We've got to have a firm foundation. We can't lose our foundation. So what is it that you're building your life on? We've got a whole community of people that say, well, you know, I'm just too busy to, to, to read the Bible. No, friend, you're too busy not to read the Bible. You have so much going on in your life, you can't afford to not have godly wisdom and discernment. You've got to get in God's word. You've got to have a firm foundation. But the moment you gamble with God, the first thing you lose is a lost foundation. The second thing is a lost favor. I'm telling you right now, you and I, we need the favor of God. We need the blessings of God. This is what it says in John 15, 5. You're like, that's New Testament. This is all. Hey, sue me. John 15, 5. We're going New Testament for a second. This is the words of Jesus. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Check this out, young person. I beg of you. Put this on your soul. Jesus says, but for apart from me, you can do nothing. 
And this is where people get twisted in their mind. People go, you don't know me. See, that's where I'm the exception because I don't serve God. And look at all that I've accumulated. That ain't blessings, friend. Those are curses. We got a generation of people that will, that will use God's name in vain in all of their music. They stand up on an award stage and they go, I just want to thank God. For what? That, that wealth that you've accumulated from, from all of that mess, that's not blessing. That's a curse that's kept you at distance from God. We got a generation, young person in the room right now. Stop envying what you think God gave that person. Because what, what, God, what you think God gave them is actually a trick that they've taken from the enemy. They've taken the bait. Now, are you, saying, are you saying, oh, well, all wealth is bad? No, God will bless you in many cases financially. But when it comes from God, you get to have peace. When, when you go and obtain it yourself, it will consume your soul with how not to lose it. The Bible says you can only serve one master. And the moment you put money as your master, God's hand comes off. You can only serve one God. Oh, I'll just serve, I'll serve my career and I'll serve God and, and I'll, I'll, I'll serve trying to become famous. And you only can serve one master. Psalm 512 says this, surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. Now, what that actually means is God blesses the righteous. You guys tracking with me? How do, I, how do I live in the will and the blessings and the favor of God? You live a righteous life. You understand that God loves you so much. He's not tricking you, tr trying to get you, like, trying to have to, I got to figure out how, how do I live in the will of God and purpose of God. He's a good father. Do you think that when it comes to my children, I have three children. Do you think that if when it comes to me blessing them, I, I make it difficult for them to understand? Well, what do I have to do to, to get dad to bless me? No, I tell them. Hey, obey the things that I've, I've told you to do. And you'll be on the receiving end of my blessings. If you don't, you'll be on my wrath. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so it's simple. you got to live it out. You, it goes on and says, verse, uh, Psalm 512, you surround them with your favor as with a shield. Man, living, living a righteous life, not by yourself, not by your own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. That's sanctification, becoming more like Jesus every day by the power of the Holy Spirit. When you walk in this, this righteousness, you, you get to be on the receiving end and you get to experience God's shield for your life. I think there are many things in our life that we won't fully grasp until we move into eternity. And we'll go, wow, there I was that day. Look at me thinking, oh, God hadn't blessed me in a while. Here I am getting stuck at another train. It's another 10 minutes to get to work. Yet you won't understand until you get to eternity. God actually had that train come by at that exact time because two miles up ahead on the highway, there was going to be a collision that was going to take your life. Do you see what I'm saying? When, 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 you, when you walk in God's in favor, there's a shield upon your life. Psalm 84, 11 says this, For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold, check this out, no good thing from those who do what is right. And what that actually means is God will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. See, because in your mind, you're still trying to manipulate God. Well, I bet I could kind of do this over here and do what's not right and still get those good things. No, you can't, friend. God does not ever lie. God's word is God's word. It's the truth for your life and mine. The, the people of Israel, they gambled with God and they lost the favor of God in this time. The third thing that you lose is a lost family. 
Since you have forgotten the laws of your God, I will forget to bless your children, is what it says in Hosea. You may think it's, it's not a big deal to reject God and to stay out of church, but you are gambling with your family's soul. What does it say in the book of Joshua? He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to just tell you what it was growing up in the shocky household. When I, when I grew up, there was no church as an option. Well, what, what if you had a fever? You sat in the back of the sanctuary. We went to church. And, and as a child, sometimes I didn't like that. But my father is strong enough to go, I don't care what you like. I know what's good for your life. You're going to get into the presence of God. I'm going to give you every opportunity I can to see you experience salvation. And what I'm saying is, for us to see this community changed and transformed with the gospel, we need some godly fathers to step up. We need some people to say, hey, we, we, church is not optional. We don't just take our kids to church when they feel like it. We're going to church. And hear me now. We have some amazing older men in this church. If there's a young man in this church, and I know there are many of you, because I've, I've personally counseled with many people. If you have grown up without a father in your life, or if you grew up with a father in your life that was not a good godly example, don't use that as an excuse to continue this in your family line. It's time, young man, to find some older men in this church and go, man, I, I really like the way that that guy treats his wife. And, and I really like the way that, that he serves this church. And I really like the way that, that his children who have now grown, I, I like how they all serve the Lord as well. Man, I, I never saw that as an example growing up. So let me invite this guy into my life to help mentor me. That's the body of Christ. That's what it looks like to be in godly community. And that doesn't just go for the men. Young women in this house, you need to do the same thing. Find some older women in this house that you can go, hey, would you mentor me? I'm single right now, and I'm looking for a Christ-centered marriage, and I see that you've been married for 30, 40 years, and, and you guys have honored God with your marriage. Could you teach me and equip me to, to what it looks like to find a godly husband? Some of y'all are baffled right now. Because you've never heard this stuff before. You've been consumed with The Bachelor and Bachelorette. And you're like, I guess I'll just wait until I get on the show and until I got 30 options. <laughs> Millennials, Gen Z, there was a time not that long ago where a man would see a woman he was interested in. He would approach her. Check this out. He would use words. We got some young guys in here now. It's like, all you can say, can I get your number? <laughs> Is your whole marriage going to be over text? Stop sliding in people's DMs. Find some biblical godly counsel in your life some of you in this house you need to stop dating people until there's somebody in this house that recommends somebody to you because you've dated 47 people ain't none of them worked out the problem is you don't choose well some of you need to get some godly counsel in your life and say hey when you see a man in this church that you think would be good for me let me know otherwise i'm gonna keep focused on jesus That ain't got nothing to do with my sermon, but you're welcome. <laughs> Some of y'all gonna get married now. All right, the, the fourth and the final thing, the fourth and the final thing that you lose when, when you gamble with God is you, a lost future. So a lost foundation, a lost favor, a lost family, and a lost future. Everything that we do today and everything we do yesterday will impact our tomorrow. What does culture say? Culture says, man, just do what you want to do. Live for your happiness right now. Seek as much pleasure as you can. Well, this is what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 and 20. This is one of those seasons where the, the people of Israel, they were, they were walking away from God. And this is what it says. 
And this is the decision many of you are going to have to make today. Today, I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long and in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The question is, when it comes to your soul, will you continue to gamble with it, thinking that you know what's best? Or will you put your soul into the hand of your heavenly father? These are the words of Jesus. In the New Testament, Jesus says, there's nothing that no one can do to pluck you from my father's hand. The only place you will find eternal security is by putting your faith and trust in him. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for the good news of the gospel that while we were still sinners, Christ, you died for us. What is the gospel? God the Father, he loves you and I so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, from heaven to earth to live a holy, perfect life, never sin, to die on the cross, to take the punishment for your life and for mine. He was placed in a tomb, but he didn't remain there. Three days later, he rose again, conquering and defeating death. Why? So that way, if you and I would put our faith in Jesus... We can be saved by his grace, his mercy, and forgiveness. And so today, you've got to ask yourself the question like the people of Israel did. Do you just know about God or do you actually know God? Today could be the day that you move from just intellectually knowing about God to moving into relationship and actually knowing the God of the universe. The Bible says that God desires for all to be saved. Well, how does that happen? God gave you this beautiful gift called free will. So with your free will, you get to decide. Do you want to receive God into your life or reject him? God is not going to force you to be in relationship with him. And if you receive him, you will receive a greater measure in eternity, spending all of eternity in the presence of God in heaven. However, with your short time on earth, the Bible says that life is like a vapor. It's here one moment, it's gone the next. If while you're here on earth, if you reject God with your life, you gamble with your soul, you think, oh man, I'll, I'll just figure it out when I get to eternity. If you gamble with your soul, God will give you a greater measure of what you desired while here on earth. Separation from him. You'll spend an eternity in a real place called hell. That's not God's desire for you. God desires for you to be with him in heaven. But the choice is yours. So if you're here today and you're like, man, I think that's me. I, I've known about God, but I, I don't know God personally. You can make that decision right now. Just say, God, forgive me of my sins. I admit to you that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And right now, I repent. That means I turn from my old life and I turn to you. I put my life in your hands. To the best of my ability, I believe that Jesus, you are who you say that you are. That you died on the cross to take the punishment for my sins that I've committed. And that three days later, you rose again, defeating death. And right now, I put my faith in you. I put my trust in you. I receive your grace. I receive your mercy. I receive your forgiveness. God, make me new. If you'd say, hey, that's me. I'm, I'm giving my life to God today. As we remain in a moment of prayer, every head still bowed, every eye still closed. If you're saying, hey, that's me. I'm, I'm giving my life to God today. For the very first time, on the count of three, would you just lift your hand saying, hey, that's me. One, 
two, three. Amazing. Hands going up all across this place. You can put your hands down. Before we move on, we don't get moments like this often. If right now the Holy Spirit was convicting you about something, that's not coming from me. That's not from a preacher. The God of the universe, he loves you so much that through the power of the Holy Spirit, he will convict you to, to take you out of things that are destroying your life. Because God wants good things for your life. And if maybe there's an area of your life that throughout this sermon, the Holy Spirit was just nudging you, convicting you of, hey, you keep gambling with me in this area. It's time to give it up. I want to encourage you, don't ignore that moment. Some of you today, you need to commit some things to God. I need to stop juggling with my relationships. I need to stop, I need to stop juggling with my finances. I need to do things God's way. And some of you, you've you just been juggling with these things, thinking you're still going to be okay. Alcoholism, pornography addictions, and, and you just keep living with it. And, and the Holy Spirit's nudging you today. You don't have to live that way anymore. Put, put it in my hands. I'm going I'm to walk you. I'm going to guide you through this. I believe that, yes, many people were saved today experience salvation and today also many testimonies are going to come from people who are just tired of sin and you're going to just fully go all in again say God my life is yours do with me as you please God we thank you so much we love you we praise you and everybody said